Hello and welcome back to another edition of Loving Literature with Miss Chowdhury. Today we are going to be looking at Pride and Prejudice. I have in the past um, gone through this with you and I have read little snippets and gone through sort of key characters but today I'm going to um, look at a very minor character although I say that but I think she's really major to the plot the storyline and um, actually to understanding women during this era period of time um, and she is Charlotte Lucas. Charlotte Lucas is Elizabeth's friend and she is the character that goes on to marry uh, Mr Collins or oh, Mr Collins but um, she does actually uh, marry him. Now in sort of dis discussion groups and forums that I'm part of one of the key questions that I've always posed is that does actually Charlotte do the right thing by Mr by marrying Mr Collins and I think the answer here has to be yes yes she does the right thing. What you really need to do is understand the context behind um, this novel in order to truly understand whether Charlotte did the right thing. Freedom for women was nowhere near what it is like today and for me to say no she didn't do the right thing it's a lot easier because I have a lot more freedom I earn my own money I have my own liberties I'm not owned by a man I can go out um, and do as I please most of the time Charlotte Lucas did not have that privilege she also didn't have the privilege of time it is far more acceptable in society now to get married as a woman or to cohabit, cohabit whatever it is that you're choosing to do much later in life. If you've chosen to get married at the age of 30, 40, 50, who cares? But back then, this was not the norm. If you were not snapped up and married by a certain age, then you were never going to find yourself married. Um, you were to find yourself a spinster and, and nothing worse really could be your fate. Remember, you did not have the luxuries of money and making your own money to go and spend as you wished or the luxuries of staying at home and doing what you wished. Therefore, you have to find a way of getting free. And I think that's what Charlotte gets across to Lizzie. The first thing I'm going to read is going to be um, a section where she is talking to Elizabeth about why she makes that choice, that choice to marry Mr. Collins, something that Lizzie at first cannot quite comprehend and does not understand why she would do this. As I'm reading, I'm really hoping that you will see um, Char why Charlotte um, makes that step, goes to the extent of marrying a ridiculous character like Mr. Collins. Um, and then I'm going to read another section, which I think proves why she did it. Not just why she says she did it, but actually proves why she did it. Okay, so I'm going to read on um, page 122 going to page 123. So if you've got a copy of your own, please feel free to go grab it and follow along with me. But on the following morning, every hope of this kind was done away. Miss Lucas called soon after breakfast and in a, a private conference with Elizabeth related the event of the day before. The possibility of Mr. Collins fancying himself in love with her friend had once occurred to Elizabeth within the last day or two, but that Charlotte could encourage him seemed almost as far from possible possibility as that she could encourage him herself. And her astonishment was consequently so great as to overcome at first the bounds of decorum and she could not help crying out engaged to mr collins my dear charlotte impossible the steady countenance which miss lucas had commanded to telling in telling her story gave way to momentary confusion her on receiving so direct a reproach though as it was no more than she expected she soon regained her composure and calmly replied why should you be surprised my dear eliza do you think it incredible that Mr. Collins should be able to procure any woman's good opinion because he was not so happy as to succeed with you? But as Elizabeth had now recollected herself and making a strong effort for it, was able to reassure her friend with tolerable firmness that the prospect of their friendship was highly grateful to her and that she wished her all imaginable happiness. I see that you are feel. I see what you are feeling replied Charlotte you must be surprised very much surprised so lately as Mr Collins was wishing to marry you but when you have try had time to think about think it all over I hope you will be satisfied with what I have done I am not romantic you know 
I never was. I ask only a comfortable home and considering Mr. Collins's character, connections and situations in life, I am convinced that with that my chance of happiness with him is as fair as most people can boast on entering the marriage state. Elizabeth quietly answered, undoubtedly, and after an awkward pause, they returned to the rest of the family. Charlotte did not stay much longer and Elizabeth was left to reflect on what she had heard. It was a long time before she became at all reconciled to the idea of so unsuitable a match. The strangeness of Mr Collins making two offers of marriage within three days was nothing in comparison of his now being accepted. She had always felt that Charlotte's opinion of matrimony was not exactly like her own, but she could not have supposed it possible that when called into action, she would have sacrificed every better feeling to worldly advantage. Charlotte, the wife of Mr. Collins, was a most humiliating picture, and to the pang of a friend disgracing herself and sunk in her esteem was added the distressing conviction that it was impossible for that friend to be tolerably happy in a lot she had chosen. So Charlotte herself says that she's not romantic and that she has never really been romantic. She isn't looking for that hero. She isn't looking for that Mr. Darcy to sweep her off her feet. But she's looking for security, leading a comfortable life. And at the end of the day, she wants a home. She wants a home to make her own, be the queen in that little small castle and be comfortable. And that is what Mr. Collins can give. I mean, he is a foolish man. He is a silly man. Um, and it's strange that um, Austin often makes her men, um, I'm sorry, her sort of clergymen into uh, funny characters of just being ridiculous. Um, but here she does explain very clearly um, what m marriage will give her. Um, and she does think that, you know, she will be happy. Now, Elizabeth sees this completely differently at the end of this scene. And she and she firmly believes that her friend won't be happy. And that's why I've chosen this next part, because I think that proves her wrong. And it proves what Charlotte did right. And I think it really clearly, without those words from Charlotte, actually shows us why Charlotte did this. So I'm going to be, read from page 153. Every object in the next day's journey was new and interesting to Elizabeth and her spirits were in state for enjoyment for she had seen her sister looking so well as to banish all fear for her health and the prospect of her northern tour was a constant source of delight. When they left the high road for the lane in Hunsford, every eye was in search of the parsonage and every turning expected to bring it in view. The paling of Rosling Park was boundary on one side. Elizabeth smiled at the recollection of all that she had heard of its inhabitants. At length, the parsonage was discernible. The garden sloping to the road, the house standing in it, and the green pals to the, and the laurel hedge, everything declared they were arriving. Mr. Collins and Charlotte appeared at the door, and the carriage stopped at the small gate, which led by the short gravel walk to the house amidst the nods and smiles of the whole party. In a moment, they were all out of their chase, rejoicing the sight of each other. Mrs. Collins welcomed her friend with the liveliest pleasure and Elizabeth was more and more satisfied with coming when she found herself so affectionately received. She saw instantly that her cousin's manners were not altered by his marriage. His formal civility was just what it had been and he detained her some minutes at the gate to hear and satisfy his inquiries after all her family. They were then with no other delay than his, his pointing out of the neatness of the entrance taken into the house and as soon as they were in the parlour he welcomed them a second time with ostentatious formality to his humble abode and punctuality repeated all his wife's offers of refreshment. Elizabeth was prepared to see him in his glory and she could not help fancying that in displaying the good proportion of the room its aspect of its furniture, he addressed himself particularly to her, as if wishing to make her feel 
what she had lost in refusing him. But though everything seemed neat and comfortable, she was not able to gratify him by any sign of repentance and rather looked with wonder at her friend what she could have so cheer that she could have so cheerful an air and with such companion when mr collins said anything of which his wife might reasonably be ashamed which certainly was not and seldom she involuntarily turned her eye on charlotte once or twice she could discern a faint blush but in general charlotte wisely did not hear after sitting long enough to admire every article of furniture in the room from the sideboard to the fender to give an account of their journey and of all that had happened in London Mr Collins invited them to take a stroll in the garden which was large and well laid out and to the cultivation of which he attended himself. To work in his garden was one of the most respectable pleasures and Elizabeth admired the command of the countenance with which Charlotte talked of his healthfulness of exercise and owned she encouraged it as much as possible. Her here leading the way through every walk and crosswalk and scarcely follow, allowing them in an interval to utter the praises he asked for, every view was pointed out with minuteness which left beauty entirely behind. He could number the fields in every direction and could tell how many trees there were in the most distant clump. For all the views which his garden or which the country or the kingdom could boast, none were to be compared with the prospect of Roselands, afforded by an op opening in the trees that bordered the park nearby opposite in front of the house. It was handsome modern building, well situated in the rising ground. Okay, so um, I'm just going to stop there. I think that pretty much shows you Charlotte has got her beautiful home um, she is very much in charge of it Mr Collins she encourages to be out in the garden she doesn't entertain his foolishness she doesn't really listen to his foolishness and she's happy that way um, she doesn't find the need to challenge him or um, argue against him she's content she's the lady of her home she's in, and she, he by the sounds of it treats her really really well as well and gives her that freedom um, and luxury and therefore what else could she ask for remember this isn't 2020 when you have notions of love and way that things should be she knows her class and her position in society would not allow her the luxuries and therefore this does and this is what she goes for from his garden mr collins could have led them around his two meadows but the ladies could not having shoes to encounter the remains of the white frost turned back and while sir william accompanied him charlotte took her sister and friend over the house extremely well pleased probably to have the opportunity of shoeing it without her husband's help it was rather small but well built and convenient and everything was fitted up and arranged with the neatness and consistency of Elizabeth, of which Elizabeth gave Charlotte all credit. When Mr Collins could be forgotten, there was really a great air of comfort throughout and by Charlotte's evident enjoyment of it, Elizabeth supposed he must be often forgotten. So that gives us an idea there that Charlotte does you know send him out and he is a busy man and he's getting on and therefore she's managed to make this her home um and really enjoy um enjoy it i'm going to read i'm just going to skip a little bit and um no actually i'll just continue reading a little bit more she had already learned that charlotte lady catherine was still in the country it was spoken of again while they were at dinner when mr collins joining in observed Yes, Miss Elizabeth, you will have the honour of seeing Lady Catherine de Bourgh in the ensuing Sunday at church. And I need not say you'll be delighted with her. She's all affability and condensation. And I doubt not but you will be honoured with some portion of her notice when service is over. I have scarcely any hesitation in saying that she will include you and my sister Mariah in every invitation with which she honours us during her stay. Her behaviour to my dear Charlotte is charming. We dine at Roslings twice every week and are never allowed to walk home. Her ladyship's carriage is regularly observed, ordered for us. 
I should say, one of her ladyship's carriages, are, um, for she has several. Lady Catherine is a very respectable, sensible woman indeed, added Charlotte, a most attentive neighbour. Very true, my dear, that is exactly what I say. She is the sort of woman whom you cannot regard with too much difference. Difference. The evening was spent chiefly in ch talking over Hertfordshire news and telling again that they had already written. And when it closed, Elizabeth, in the solitude of her chamber, had to mediate upon Charlotte's degree of contentment, understand her dress and guiding composure and bearing with her husband and to acknowledge that it was all done very well. She had also to anticipate how her visit would pass the quiet tenor of their usual employments the vexation interruptions of Mr Collins and the gaieties of their intercourse with Rosalind's. A lively imagination soon settled it all. Right, that's where I'm going um, to stop. So you can see that Elizabeth herself um, is quite sort of pleased um, with the way that the uh, sort of things are for her friend. Her friend also again points out that she is treated well by the neighbours and now she knows someone of substance as well, somebody, a la the lady, great lady Catherine. So again, you can tell that her friend um, has that status, has that honour that she's been looking for. So I think, you know, she did the right thing. She, Charlotte did the right thing, marrying a very ridiculous Mr Collins, but nonetheless did the right thing. Read for yourselves and then let me know do you agree? Have I given all the right reasons why I think she's done the right thing? Do you agree she's done the right thing? Thank you for watching my video. I hope you've enjoyed um, listening to a little bit of more Pride and Prejudice. Please pick this up and have a read. I will be back. I'm going to look at more and juicy sections. Um, I've looked at sort of the, the comical characters. I've looked at Mr. Bennett, who I think is a good father, but again, very controversial. A lot of people feel that he is actually an awful father. I have looked at Elizabeth. I've looked at Darcy and um, obviously I can't say no, nothing bad about him. But I am going to look at the villain um, in this novel next, which is Mr. Wickham. OK, take care. Hope you're enjoying um, these sessions. Uh, any feedback is great. Please um, like, subscribe. And um, I will be back with another episode of Loving Literature with Miss Chowdhury very, very soon. Take care. Good night.